Morning, everybody. Hope everybody's keeping well. Uh, so the talk is going to be, as it says, about diving the wrecks of his uh, Croatia. But it's from the point of view of um, organising a dive trip and, and doing the drive at uh, the dives, basically. Um, so I'm not going to talk about archaeology. I'm no great historian, and you'll probably see that my photography is not the world's greatest, but uh, it does give you a good idea. What I've done is I have um, borrowed photographs from people that have been on the trip with us and uh, people that I know that have also been to, uh, to Croatia. Uh, and I've got some decent photographs, so hopefully it will be of, uh, of some interest. We were supposed to be there uh, the beginning of, uh, of May and obviously with the current position that got, um, that got cancelled um actually the diving has started out there in viz um I was talking to andy from Manti divers the other morning they've got their first group out from germany so diving is happening and it's starting resuming but anyway let's talk about um diving the wrecks of, uh, of viz the picture that we've got in front of us is uh, uh, of the wrecks that i'm, I'm going to focus on um this morning so Let's talk about Viz a little bit first. So um, Viz is the furthest Croatian inhabited island from the Croatian uh, coastline. Uh, there are a number of reasons why people might want to go to Viz, diving being the reason why I, why I would go there. But the other reasons uh, are Mamma Mia 2 was filmed there, they produce an awful lot of wine, and I suppose as much as anything is absolutely gorgeous. And um, linked to that as well, though, is that it has played uh, a part in World War II. Um, it has a, an interesting history, as Viz, because it's been occupied by many, many different uh, sort of uh, governments, if you will, and, and countries. So Britain have had uh, a hand in it at one point. Uh, Austria have been involved, uh, obviously, um, Croatia, uh, the Italians. So it's been a strategic point for, uh, for war for a number of uh, so centuries, never mind years. The, um, the reason that, again, that it's such a fantastic location from a diving perspective is the part that it played in, in World War II, and that's kind of what we're going to focus on. So um, during the, I nearly did a only Phil's Norse's moment then, during the war, um, this has, or had, should I say, an airstrip on it, and that's been used by um, the British during the, uh, the Second World War, so Spitfires and Hurricanes flew from, from there, and there was also an American presence, and they extended the, um, the runway on Viz so that planes coming back from bombing raids, if they couldn't make it back across the Adriatic, they could um, land at Viz. And basically, the uh, the air uh, the runway and the supporting infrastructure was used to save countless numbers of planes, but more importantly, thousands of lives. And what they did, they landed the planes, dragged them off the runways, um, and you know, allowed other damaged planes to to come and land. Now, there is a, a particular day in uh, 1944 when supposedly 37 B-24s. Um, damaged B-24s landed on the island of Viz. Um, because of the, the huge demand uh, and the huge number of damaged planes that, um, that needed to use the facilities, uh, it wasn't always possible for the planes to, to land on the, uh, the runway itself. So that's why we've ended up with uh, plane wrecks in the, in the sea and the surrounding area, and that, again, we'll, we'll come on to um, shortly. So as I said at the start, it's, a, um, it's almost a, a dive trip uh, report, if you will, that I'm, I'm going to run through. So I'm, I'm going to talk about getting there, the facilities and all those sort of things. So as I said before, there are a lot of people that have helped me put this together in terms of providing pictures. Um, and uh, I'll kind of point those out as I go through and thank people as we go along. So let's have a, a move on to the next one. Okay, so the, the map over on the right-hand side of the screen, and hopefully you're on a screen that's big enough to allow you to see this, 
I should say, if you can turn up the brightness on your screen, now's a good time to do it. Because some of the underwater photography uh, is quite dark, so the brighter you can get it, excuse me, the better. So Split as a, an international airport that's served by um, the main airports from, from the UK. So actually getting into Split is fairly straightforward. What we've then got to achieve is getting from Split to Viz. So um, when we've done it, we book uh, a couple of large minibuses and head down into to split to the uh, to the harbour there. Um, it's very very difficult to get across how much luggage you will have. So we're going taking rebreathers to do these dives, um, and if we're not taking rebreathers, we're obviously taking off awful lots of uh, equipment. So um, it does take a little bit of explaining, and even then, you get the raised eyebrows. So. If you are going to do something like this, we need to um, really, really labour the point that you've got an awful lot of kit. When you get down into Split, uh, to the harbour, there are two options to get you out to Viz. And there's a, a catamaran, deliberately spelt with a K, because that's how they spell it over there, uh, and a car ferry. So the catamaran is significantly quicker, but it has uh, really only facility for um, people who are going on day trips. And so when we turned up, and I've got a picture in a minute with a, a ton of luggage, um, people look, well, the people on the boat look at you as though you're you crackers. We go, the last two times we've been, and we're going again next year in May, so it's quiet. Um, so if you speak nicely and shake hands with a, a 20 euro note, they are incredibly um, accommodating and you can get all your kit on. If you're going at a busier time of the year, the, the car ferry would probably make more sense. Um, significantly slower, uh, but there's a, a, a huge amount of room to get all the kit on. What we've tried to do is to marry up the, the sailing so that you're not stood around for ages. So the catamaran always works out better for us. Um, but as I say, the, uh, the, the large ferry works as well. Another option, uh, did this on the first trip would be to stay over in Split because Split itself is fantastic and it's worth having a good look round. But if you if you're there to go diving, you want to get there and make the the best of the the week that you've got. So those are the the kind of options that we've got to get there. So from the picture, uh, we're still alongside there the, uh, the catamaran, huge pile of luggage. Uh, you can't quite see the extent of it on this trip. I think there were fourteen of us. Um, we were supposed to go earlier in May with 18. Um, so for me, from a, the point of view of organizing the trip, um, I, I can't relax until we actually get to the dive center because there are a number of hurdles to get across. And this is obviously one of them getting um, everybody's kit onto the, uh, onto the ferry. Once on the catamaran, plenty of room for a little bit of a nod. And um, that's some of the, um, one or two of the members that are on the, the line at the moment have a bit of a kip whilst we're um, we're travelling. But as you can see, there isn't really a dedicated area for the uh, the luggage. It's all piled at the the back left hand corner where there's a little bit of a gap. And then we've got a picture just showing us disappearing from uh, from split from the the mainland. The catamaran, as I said, moves at quite a speed, and um, it's a a quick way of getting across to the uh, to the island of Viz. Uh, you'll notice that some of the weather conditions are drastically different on the pictures. So I think this one is from uh, arriving on the the ferry to so the car ferry, which we did the previous year. Um, we arrived in glorious weather, and it's just showing the. So that's the town of Viz, and that's where um, both the. Uh, catamaran and the ferry uh, dock. From there, you've then got to travel uh, over the hills um, to Camisa, where the uh, the dive centres are. So and that's a picture of um, Camisa, uh, which is on the west coast of uh, of Viz. So, uh, um, two main towns: Viz town. Um, and Camisa. Camisa is uh, a more traditional um, fishing village, um, and that's where there are a number of a number of dive centres, um, and that's where uh, for our trip uh, we're based. And the the presentation I've focused 
from kind of now onwards on the the diving side of things and then towards the end some of the um the kind of the scenery and uh history stuff um that gives a bit of a, a view of what the facilities are like there so when we went we've been twice we went with manta divers and the reason that we ended up going with manta divers is there was a an article in the um visa scuba magazine um and i think it's fair to say that um croatia um from a uk perspective is uh, an area that there's getting more and more interested in uh, interest in diving perhaps not um, that well known until maybe a couple of years ago and certainly the article in scuba magazine um, and in particular the b17g which we'll, uh, we'll come on to um, has increased the uh, the interest massively in in diving um, croatia manta divers were in the uh, uh, the scuba magazine and um, they seemed like the natural choice and, and to be honest uh, you know there, there are other companies out there so ISA, ISSA um, located very close to, to manta divers again an excellent um, facility but as you say we ended up using manta divers and uh, they particularly looked after us so the boat that you see the one with the uh, the mast on it the manta divers catamaran is what we used for our uh, as our diving platform they have two cats big one that you see there and a smaller one which um i think can maybe take 10 divers and the big ones 14 technical divers and probably 20 recreational divers I must say at this point it is possible to do both technical and recreational diving that's what we did on the last trip we took um, divers of both uh, sort of interests and were able to um to operate from one boat uh, and keep everybody reasonably happy. Um, so, Manta Divers, right from the, the seafront, just a, a short walk from um, the accommodation from the main area of Kimiza. Um, it's run, it's a family run diving centre. So, uh, Andy is uh, our kind of um, skipper and and guide um, and looked after us whilst we're out there. So trimix, um, nitrox, support, um, rebreathers, kit hire, and pretty much sort out anything that you want. And as I say, very, very good. In the um, in the off season, they run a side scanner and they've been responsible for finding some of the wrecks out there. So they found a second uh, B-17 bomber, which is in 100 metres of water and upside down. They also found one of the um, the best wrecks uh, out there, the uh, Michael and Maris, which we'll talk about. Um, uh, and they only access rights to that. So again, another reason perhaps to go, uh, go with Manta. But as I say, other dive centres are available. <laughs> so let's talk about the diving. So the... Um, the illustrations that uh, that we've got come from um, a dive book about diving in Croatia, and these were provided by the, uh, the dive centre. Um, the Teti. So we've got a, um, a steamship, cargo ship, um, that was carrying uh, granite cobbles and um, sets, perhaps depending on which part of the country you're from. Um, and ran aground during a storm, uh, but it makes a, a fantastic uh, check dive. So the, the top of the reef there, where you can see where the boilers are, and the, it's all flattened, so that was the, the pointy end. That's just in eight metres, and then down at the, uh, at the stern, you can get 31 metres, so it makes a, a fantastic um, check dive. It has a swim through on it, um, the swim throughs and the main feature is the uh, the stern wheel which um, is very very photogenic as you'll probably see from uh, from the next slide or the slide after that one i should say so on the the left we've got uh one of our number mr conlon just uh, uh, hanging around either the start or the end of the dive probably the uh, the end of the dive and as i say that bit's eight so for, from a point of view of weight checks, um, 
making sure everybody's happy is spot on from that or that sorry um, the island that you can see as the main picture on that screen reminds me of the rondo uh, actually but anyway um, it's just outside of the harbour so it's a very very short um, steam out of the uh, to the dive site and uh, again the help with somebody I don't know, perhaps forgets the dry suit or something. Not saying that that's happened, of course. Okay, so let's have a look at some more pictures on the Teddy. So, um, because of it, its location, uh, the, um, the sea life is quite interesting. So, the top left hand corner, we've got a, a conger eel in, a, um, in part of the wreck in some sort of tube, and you know, they're reasonably common out there, but it's also, one of those places where you get um, congas and mores together. Um, so that makes it quite interesting from a, a photography point of view. Um, the picture below that, so the bottom left, just gives you an angle of the deck, and it's actually a, a side on shot of the wheel. Um, and the, the picture over on the, uh, the right hand side, and Sean Roberts, who's on the, uh, the line. We'll recognise it. That's uh, that's Nina. Um, Sean and I use the same Go GoPro for uh, for taking pictures, but Sean has got a light rig. Um, takes some fantastic photographs. So that's one that I must thank uh, Sean for. Um, but as I say, that's the the main sort of photographic uh, opportunity, if you will, on the on this wreck. Uh, and you can see from the, the, the big smiley eyes that uh, that was a, a dive that was being thoroughly enjoyed. What we've then got is a couple of dark pictures, so uh, hopefully you can see them. The picture on as you're looking at it, so the, the, uh, the right hand side, the diver with the, the twin sets, um, that's uh, the swim through so you can get into the deck, nice and big open space, and then there are two options of coming out of it. The little hole that I believe that will be Mr. Conlon trying to get through, because um, that's his uh, his preference to go through the, the smaller openings, and then there's a, a bigger opening further down that's very very easy to get out of. But you can just about make out the granite uh, cobbles or sets that um, that were the cargo on that uh, on the, uh, the ship when it sank. The other picture is um, that's one that. Uh, Fran, Dr. Fran Hockley has um, kindly allowed me to use. So uh, I've never done this myself, but it sounds like a fantastic idea. The, um, the Tetty can be done as a, a night dive, so free from currents pretty much, very close to the dive center, and um, very easy to cover uh, with the boat. So again, a, another fantastic option that, uh, that can be taken on that wreck. It's, um, it's one of those wrecks that if it was anywhere else, um, certainly if it was in UK waters, it would be dived and dived and dived and dived. Um, you're out there and if you've gone for a second time, it's like, oh, shall we do the Teddy? Um, but it is a fantastic dive and it's certainly a really, really good way of making sure that, um, that everybody's kit's working as it should be and everybody's waiting somewhere near. So we'll move on. Uh, the next wreck that we're going to look at is a, a wreck called the Fortunal, uh, which wasn't very Fortunal because it, <laughs> it ran into the uh, into the wall. Um, the, there's a story to it, and I think there, there might have been alcohol involved. Um, so it's a, a modern fishing trawler, modern fishing boat, wooden, um, sank in 1997. And it lies in between 35 and 51 meters of water, which um, Sounds like a bit of a jump from the uh, from the last dive, and it is. But the beauty of this wreck site is that it's um, it's against a wall, um, so you can drop into the water in a, a fairly sheltered area. And for the people who are perhaps sports diver, and I would recommend that sports diver equivalent is uh, about the, the the lowest level, you know, qualification for this sort of trip. Um, you can see the wreck clearly from the wall. Um, with it being at, at 35 meters, you can get to the, the uh, have a, a decent look at the, the wreck. Um, but the wall then follows around a very scenic dive. 
um, and there's a cave that's somewhere around six or seven meters from memory and um, that you can go into uh, so it's another dive that can be, be done by pretty much all the members of the group um, there is the opportunity at the uh, the bowels of the boat to, to drop down and it says it's 51 meters you can get a little bit more if um, you want to take photographs of, of the wreck and uh, looking back up at it um, so it's a, a another nice dive so we've got some pictures I think I don't think I know okay so uh, my photography apologies so it's a, a little dark so on the, the top um, left as I'm looking at it, as we're looking at the screen, we've got um, Paul looking at the uh, at the wreckage. So the front end of the, the trawler is significantly damaging. It's had a, a right good clatter against the uh, against the rocks. Below that, we've got uh, Sean looking for wildlife underneath the uh, the the wreck. Um, so you get an idea of the lighting that he was using, which does make a a huge difference in terms of the the photography and then the large picture it's gone black and white i've changed it to black and white because um, that's it's not quite the, the limit of my um editing abilities but it, it's a, a definite shortcut for me so you've got the mass on the uh, on the wreck with a diver and a, and a torch kind of um giving us a little bit of perspective um it's worth saying with this dive um You've got options you can be put in against the wall and you can drop down the wall or if you, you're feeling uh, that you want something a little bit more exhilarating you can um, be dropped sort of directly above the wreck and it's a, uh, a free descent then down to um, sort of 40 meters to get to the wreck which is um, you know quite exhilarating a bit of uh, skydiving if you will uh, so these pictures for the the year before we just give you a bit of an idea there's a there's an awful lot more light that day a little bit of a better uh view of the um, of the wreck so well rotted um timbers um it's the, you know you spend maybe 15 20 minutes looking around the wreck and taking some some pictures and then it's, it's one of those times where heading off around the wall looking for um for wildlife and um having a look in the cave at the end and then being picked up in the uh, in the sheltered bay the way we uh, we plan to do the trip and it may makes this a little bit more difficult because of the the potential for the weather but it was we we're building up so the um, the b17 um, we thought was the main event certainly the first time we went um, but actually you're building up towards as I say the b17 and the uh, and the Maris, which uh, is an incredible dive, but we'll talk about in a few minutes. Okay, so uh, the next thing we're going to talk about is the Vasilios. And I have a tendency to spell it with either two S's or two L's, and I can't remember which is right. So forgive me if somebody knows that I've got it wrong. Um, <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. So the, the Vasilios, it's uh, another steamship. 105 meters in length not in depth which is a bonus um the depth of the wreck is from 22 meters to 53 meters so there's a bit of something for everybody and, and as with um the majority of the wrecks that we dived out there they're against the reef not a huge surprise they've run into it haven't they but um, it, it does mean that um you can be dropped on the reef and work your way down to it so it's nice and shallow when you're getting in it's really useful for for depot and being picked up afterwards so the the Vasilios, again another of those wrecks that if it was in the uk it would be the best wreck uh, and would be dive to death uh, for us it was um sort of the second dive i think on the uh, on the first day and it's one that we came back to a few times because there's an awful lot to see on it. It's a, a big old wreck, and there's, there's, you can spend a good bit of time on it. So, cargo it was carrying was coal. Um, there are some swim throughs uh, on it, and it's just worth noting that there is still oil in the wreck, so you've got to be careful um, if you are going into the holds. It isn't actually recommended, but um, it is possible to do. Put on the, the slide that it's Sports Diver Plus. Um, 
because of the depth. But again, it's another dive that everybody can um, can enjoy and sort of pick the depth and see quite a bit from it. So let's have a look at some pictures. So with it being a, a big old wreck, um, the reason obviously that there are uh, illustrations is to actually get that as a picture would be nearly impossible. So my pictures will demonstrate that. So top left, there's an anchor that runs from the wreck uh, up onto the reef. So a nice sort of reference point. There can be um, currents on this wreck, not particularly strong. But again, it gives you a bit of a reference for when we're, uh, we're looking to be, uh, to be picked up. Below that, we've got the, the funnel that's uh, starting to collapse and corrode on the, uh, on the seabed. Top right, we've got uh, an anchor on the, the deck and with um, Neil as uh, a muse for the picture. And then at the bottom, we've got uh, one of the, the masts that we used for, uh, for loading the ship. So that um, fairly significant, uh, robust piece of, uh, of wreckage there that gives you the opportunity to get out and a little bit away from the wreck. Um, and maybe look back on it and uh, take some pictures, if you will. Um, top left, we've got Neil emerging from the uh, the hold. So again, big open hold um, that allow you to go and have a bit of a look in. Um, as I mentioned before, there are some swim throughs through the superstructure that um, uh, fairly straightforward. But again, don't do them if you're not. Uh, qualified to do so. Below that, we've got the uh, the prop. So one of the features, and the first time I dived it, uh, I have to admit to um, not having realized that I was looking at the prop. So uh, there you go. Anyway, um, so a huge prop, uh, lots and lots of life on it. Um, so you can see from the, the bottom right hand picture, the, the kind of core of the, uh, the soft sponges, if you get some lighting on it. Um, and that's at the, uh, I was going to say something really silly then, obviously it's at the stern of the wreck, but it's at the deepest part of the, of the dive. So that's the opportunity there, the seabed, 51 sort of meters, if uh, we're using it as um, a build up to get a little bit more depth. The top right hand picture, we've got Nina again. So it's uh, another picture. Thank you, Sean. Um, so you can just see the mast. Uh, in the in the background there, and he's looking from the, uh, the stern back along the uh, the deck of the ship. Fantastic dive, um, lots of scope, lots of uh, opportunity to dive it. You know, quite a few times. Always something um, different to, to see. Companion ways that you can swim along on the uh, the outside of the wreck. And, uh, as I say, a very very interesting uh, dive. Okay, so we start to move on to, I suppose, what makes Viz a Viz. The, um, there are two dives that I suppose people would um, look at as being um, signature dives. So you may well have seen um, a video, sorry, uh, a webinar that was done by Phil Short recently, which is around um, an archaeological uh, project that, uh, that Phil um, did an awful lot of work on. Uh, he managed the the uh, the divers basically, uh, where they look to recover um, remains of the divers. So the the, uh, the B twenty four bomber. So when we first went out to um, to Viz, because this is um, broken up, and I'll talk about that in a, in a moment or two. And um, this looks like the smaller of the two aeroplane wrecks, but actually it's the, um, the B-24 is slightly bigger. Um, but because the wreckage is, uh, is damaged, you don't quite get that, that perspective. So let's have a look at the, uh, the figures. So the, the, the wreck is the uh, Tulsa American. Uh, it's the name of the, uh, the plane. Uh, I'm sorry, I was talking about Phil Short. If you get the opportunity, that has been recorded. It's well worth the watch. Um, there's also some video footage that's, uh, that's available that goes with um, the talk that, that Phil did, and it gives a, a lot of detail around the uh, fantastic um, work that they did, which was to uh, recover and then repatriate the American um, airmen. 
of their uh, remains. So the wreck lies on a plateau um, and the main part of the wreckage, so looking at the illustration, the wings, the engines, the cockpit, um, is in 40 metres. At the, the bottom sort of right of the illustration, you can see uh, some further wreckage. So there is the tail section of the plane and um, one of the props um, and the, uh, some uh, of the guns that are at 52 metres. So it's possible to do both of those um, in one dive bolt. Um, there's a reasonable amount of current on this dive. So the, the last time we went last year, we talked about um, doing both, but actually when we got down on the, uh, on the wreck, the current was such that if you went from one to the other, you, you wouldn't be getting back between them without, uh, without a scooter. So that's uh, certainly something to think, uh, to think about. So the wreckage, yeah, it's got uh, a 33 meter wingspan, so a, a big old plane. Um, and uh, as I say, it's in, it's in two parts. So the, the B-24 bombers, so this particular bomber, um, seven of the crew were rescued, three went down with the wreck. The difference between this type of plane, so the B-24 and the B-17, lots and lots of differences, but from the point of view of how it's ended up, is the, um, the position of the wings. So on the B-24, the wings are raised a part way up the fuselage. So at the B-17, the wings are at the bottom of the fuselage. The reason why that makes a difference for the, the wreckage is that uh, on the B-17, when that landed, the wings uh, are level with the fuselage, so they were able to kind of bounce along the water and the plane stayed intact. With the, um, the B-24, because the wings are raised up from the, uh, the fuselage, it's a smaller surface area that hits the water. They have a, a tendency to um, nose dive and break, um, and the tail section breaks away, and that's why the wreckage uh, of the B-24 is as it is. So as I say, it's a, a war grave and there were three lives lost um, when this plane uh, crashed. And it, it, it crashed because it, uh, the engines quiet. I think, I believe this one went out of fuel and it wasn't able to make it to the, um, to the runway. And um, so it, it ditched as nearby as it, as it possibly could. So let's have a look at some pictures. Um, so, uh, I believe it was last year, it was certainly there when we went, there's now been a, a large uh, concrete mooring buoy that's been, uh, mooring block, sorry, that has a buoy on it that's been, uh, that's been put on the plateau. And there's a line that runs from that to um, the main wreckage site. So one of the engines um, still has its prop uh, and on that same side, so the wreck's upside down, um, the wheel is extended. Um, and again, very, very sort of uh, photogenic. If you haven't dived plane wrecks before, um, it's an amazing sight to, uh, to come across on a, on a dive, if you will. You know you're going to, but when you see it for the first time, it is uh, quite incredible. Um, and we're not talking you know, like diving Cape and Ray or something like that, where we've got planes that have been put in there um, intentionally, but say quite in incredible to come across. So picture from um, the year before with a, a, a bit more light. So that's the, uh, the other wing and you can just see. Uh, so we're looking from towards the wing tip, if you will, back towards the, uh, the fuselage, uh, towards the cockpit, sorry, the, um, from that area. Uh, on the wing, so this is the wing that doesn't have the wheel extended, the wheel's been uh, smashed off basically on that side and the engine on this side is significantly more damaged but it gives you an idea of what we're looking at um there is because of the type of wreck that it is there's live ammunition about so um it's definitely not something that we want to be picking up and taking away from the wrecks uh, um some of the ammunition that's used so somebody on on the uh, the webinar will probably know but every so many of bullet would have been a tracer got phosphorus in it we definitely won't, don't want to be taking those out of the water we all know um 
look, don't touch. And one of the things about Viz is that the, the wrecks haven't been pillaged. And I'll talk about that a little bit more, but from a safety perspective, yeah, that's something that we definitely need to bear in mind. Um, so another picture, back slightly, if you will, from uh, the, the first set of images. So showing the, um, the propeller, the extended wheel, and there are a couple of other things just to look at. And I think you can see my cursor, so I'll waggle that around and, uh, and show it. So we've got the line here. So there's a, a line that runs to the, um, the mooring, um, makes it nice and easy to get to and from. Um, because of the current, uh, you know, there's a little bit of work involved. Sometimes it can be a little bit milky on there as well, but uh, by and large, the Viz in Viz uh, is very, very good. What we've also got in the photograph is a parachute. So uh, at the front of the wreck, yeah, there's a parachute that um, I think it wasn't deployed by somebody uh, trying to escape it. It was uh, deployed as part of the um, kind of the, the damage that was was to the wreck. And it was in this area that the excavations that Phil Short talked about, that they, they ended up finding, um, I think it was a femur actually, uh, that was then later identified and um, they actually found through using DNA of the uh, surviving, sorry, families of the people that were on the plane, um, the identity of the individuals uh, uh, whose bone they found. They also found, um, a wedding ring when they did the excavation but as i said there's a, a fantastic um presentation that was done by uh, phil short regarding that and seek it out if you if uh, if you can have a, a watch because it is very very good all right so let's see if i can get my controls back over this side um so the other side so you drop down the shot and the wreck is in one direction and then there's a uh, one of the gun turrets with the guns um that's the other side of the the block again very photogenic uh, the fairly typical yellow sponges that you get on them but everything's still there it's uh, as i say incredible um to dive and to have a, a look around and with it being 40 meters um nice depth to spend a little bit of time and with there being a, a fixed shot in um nice and uh, comfortable for deco Okay, moving on. Uh, the next wreck we're going to look at is a wreck called the Brioni. So the Brioni is uh, a steam, it was a cargo and passenger ship, 70 meters long, and it, uh, it lies between 45 meters and 61 meters. This again is against the, uh, the reefs so of the sterns, against the reef, it's pointing away, uh, if you will. Sank in um, 1993. Uh, and where my picture is on the screen, I don't know if I'm in your way of looking at it, but it says at the bottom there are swim throughs. So wooden decks and the wooden decks have largely rotted away, which means that you can get access into the, uh, into the wreck fairly, uh, fairly easily. Um, so we're, we're starting moving a bit deeper, 45 meters uh, is the start of the wreck, but it is up against the reef. Um, so it is possible. Uh, as our group did last year for uh, um, those sports divers or advanced uh, twin set divers that are 35, 40 meters to come out, have a, uh, a look over the, the wreck and then to, um, to dive the, uh, the reef and look for the octopus and other creatures that you, you find on there. Uh, so as I say, largely intact wreck, um, Great for, for photography, the, uh, the bowels, um, sort of 61 meters. And um, so, so we're getting a little bit deeper. So the picture, I think I took the picture, but it's shown light in it. And um, so we're at the, uh, the, the bowels, the anchor there. Um, that's the, the maximum depth. Um, at the time of year that we went may the there's a bit of sort of silt in the water you can get some fantastically clear uh, sort of visibility where it's possible that you can come a little bit further off the wreck and maybe get uh, some sort of bigger shots or more of the wreck in um so we've got 
Neil, who was associated in quite a lot of these pictures, Neil going along the uh, uh, through the companionways and level sort of with the deck to his right. Um, so you can swim all the way the the length of the uh, the the wreck, following the um, the companionway, staying kind of shallowish on the way out, and then uh, dropping down into it. Next photograph is of Neil just about to head in. So as I said, nice big open spaces that you can uh, you can see uh, the outside all the time, if you will. Plenty of light going into there. You can have a, bit, a look inside and see uh, and see what there is. That's an attempt to get a little bit further away from the wreck, just to look back on it. We've got the, the divers with their torches, fortunately, um, looking back. And uh, as you say, you get a little bit of a perspective. Um, those that know Sean will know, will not be surprised to see that he's looking underneath the wreck to see what uh, wildlife we've got down there. So that's the, the lighting at the, uh, at the bottom of the wreck. And then that's uh, the end of the dive heading back from the, uh, from the, the deepest part of the dive, uh, heading back towards the reef to, um, to finish off the dive and do some deco. Uh, we all commented the last time we went that um, the, there's that much in terms of wrecks uh, at Viz that there's a danger that you don't spend enough time exploring what are world-class fantastic uh, reef, uh, reef, sorry, wrecks and this is the point in case for us um a wonderful wreck but um we were trying to get as much as we possibly can into the trip so we're doing uh with two exceptions that we'll talk about two dives a day uh, and with this being at, at 61 meters we uh didn't end up spending an awful lot of time on it where it definitely warranted um, spending more time and having a, a good look around it. But we knew when we went and um, we were more than happy with it, that the, uh, the trip was designed to cater for both recreational divers and technical divers and um, you know, make a compromise and keep everybody happy. But as I say, this is one that um, well worth exploring and giving a little bit more time to. There's a, a lot more to it than, than meets the eye initially. Okay, so we're we're now moving towards what are the the um, the main events, if you will. So the B-17G uh, bomber, uh, Flame Fortress. Um, I think it's fair to say that when you descend on this dive, uh, it's surreal. So let's uh, let's talk about let's talk numbers and um, then we'll talk about the dive, if you will. So it, the wreck lies between 65 and 72 meters, so it's a, a big dive. Um, it's very, very close to the shore. It can actually be done uh, incredibly as a, as a shore dive. It's within 100, 100 meters of the uh, shore. Uh, and it's largely sheltered, so um, not an awful lot of current. The, uh, the shot line that's on this wreck is just below the surface, so that it's um, uh not so much hidden people know where it is but it's not advertising the fact and it's also a very um slight uh, shot line if you will very thin uh, shot line so the idea is you go down this on do the wreck and then um it, it's close to a reef that you can uh, you can fin over to and, uh, and deco on the uh, on the reef so the the wreck 31 meter wingspan whereas the b24 had um 33 but as you, when you dive this one compared to the other one, this seems a much bigger wreck. Uh, 22 meters long, and I've put at the bottom there one of the best preserved World War II airplane wrecks in the world. Um, it looks as though, uh, in fact, these, these are Phil Short's words, because um, there is actually uh, the body of an airman on this wreck that they are planning to, um, to excavate at some time when everything's been put, put back by the coronavirus. But um, they are hoping to be able to repatriate the uh, the remains of the diver, on, uh, sorry, the uh, airman from this one as well. But um, people come from all over the world to try and take pictures of this wreck. 
the pictures that I'm going to show you, uh, they give you a good feel for the wreck. They're, it's interesting, don't get me wrong. Um, but if you were to uh, do a search on the internet for pictures of the, the B-17G, you will see some fantastic images where people have waited for the right conditions. Um, and if you get those right conditions, you can see it well before you get to it and you can get the, the full um, plane into the, the image. Um, whenever we've dived it, whilst the vis is superb when you get down there, it's not that sort of that standard. Um, but, uh, so I pop, saw a question pop up there. What I should have said is, um, the group of divers that went last time, from the technical point of view, all but um, one of us were closed circuit. Neil dives open circuit, and yes, it can be done open circuit. Uh, the dives in the illustration are blowing bubbles. Um, people dive it on silly, unsafe configurations, but um, from a doing it properly perspective, yes, it can be done on uh, open circuit. So, the reason that the the uh, the aircraft is as well preserved as it is is to basically down to the skill of the pilot, but also the position of the wing. So the wings are flush with the bottom of the fuselage, which means that when it hits the water, it kind of skips along the water and then comes to rest. Um, the crew member that um, that died on the plane uh, was killed in a by flak whilst when the plane was uh, was damaged. So nobody actually died when the plane uh, crash landed on the water, again, ran out of fuel. Um, and the plane took long enough to sink to allow everybody to be got off the plane and, and rescued. Unfortunately, the body of the, uh, the airman that was killed um, stayed on the, on the wreck. But as I say, there is a, a project being created to, um, to look to uh, recover the remains. So let's have a look at some pictures. So I think that might have been the picture that was used to um, to advertise the the talk, or it's one that's very very similar. So this is um, me trying to make very very blue pictures look okay. But it, I mean, uh, I really like that picture, and it's it's not because I took it, but it's um, quite atmospheric in that you've got the the cockpit and you've then got the gun just behind the cockpit, and you can see the star of the wings. Um, same uh, area taken from the side, and that was the year before on a on a much brighter day. And the, the cockpit isn't on fire. We've put a torch in it to try and light it up. It's limited success, but it gives you an idea of um, the level of preservation of the um, the wreckage. So the wreckage is in is incredible condition. It, it genuinely is astounding to dive this thing. Um, you know the uh, the body is largely intact, um, and as, as I said before, and it was Phil Short's words, it looks as though the sea's been emptied, it's been landed, and then they've filled it back up. It's, uh, it's just positioned as though, you know, it, um, it couldn't have got there through a, a crash, basically. Looking into the cockpit, so one of Sean's pictures, um, you can see the controls, again, everything that was on it is still on it. it the, the wrecks aren't looted, um, everything's still there and in sort of fantastic order. So you can have a, a good look at it, but obviously not get inside the wreckage because um, you don't want to damage it. Another Sean's pictures. So looking from uh, the cockpit back to the uh, to the gun that's just behind there, the, the actual guns on the other side of it. So that's the, the turret. We then got a picture of Sean above um the wings looking back towards the tail so if you squint and you know what you're looking at you can just about start to make out the tail section um but again gives a kind of uh, a feeling of the um of what the dive is like uh so scale there's a ccr diver um looking out across one of the wings um so a, a big old wreck you know 31 meters across um and if you get out towards the ends of ends of the wings, looking back towards the plane again, fantastic sort of uh, views of the uh, the wreckage. 
engines. So all four props, all four props are still on the engines. Uh, as I say, incredible. And um, the way it's positioned uh, after having been and dived this and then gone back uh, and for whatever reason been in Cape and Ray, uh, the position of the, the main plane wreck at Cape and Ray is very, very similar to this, the level of kind of how intact the plane is. It's not far off that. It, it is genuinely incredible how much uh how in good sort of order this plane is uh so this is me turning the blue off looking um from above the wing forwards so you can see two engines and you can just see in the right of the shot where the torch is um the uh there's a diver with a torch there that kind of lights up where the um the cockpit area of the plane is Another shot looking from above it, so somebody's um, thankfully shining some light on it. So again, you get that uh, that picture. There's uh, a rope across it that I think is a fishing net. The first time we dived it, Andy uh, was doing a little bit of housekeeping whilst we were having a look around the place, um, sending up some nets on uh, lift bags to just keep it nice and clean. So. Uh, just um, gives you the contrast between my photography and Sean's photography. The fantastic picture there of the tail gun. Um, that's the deepest part of the wreck, so 72 metres to the seabed. Obviously, the tail's sat on the, the seabed, so you're 70-ish metres at this uh, at this point. Um, guns are still there. I'm led to believe they've never done it, but the guns still move. Um, so, as I say, fantastic condition. And then another dark uh, shot, so it would have been hideously blue at some point, but you're just looking at, towards the, uh, the front of the, the plane, a couple of divers silhouetted against it. Um, as I say, have a look on uh, Google. Google the, uh, the uh, B-17G. Interestingly, the plane was brand new. So I think it was its maiden uh, voyage. Um, it hadn't been named, it hadn't got the squadron markings on it or anything. Um, so it uh, suffered fatal damage on its, uh, on its first ever bombing roll. So from the, uh, the wreckage, um, ingrained in, me, in my mind, it'll mean nothing to people that haven't dived it, but you head off at 11 o'clock and you, you follow the contours of the seabed and you, you come to, the, um, you come to the, the wall that we then go up. Um, obviously, if you're going to do that, it needs to be ingrained in your mind because we don't want to be going in the, uh, in the wrong direction. Okay, so we're going to talk about the Michael N. Maris, um, but I think um, people will say that aeroplane wrecks are not an awful lot to them. Um, I feel completely the opposite, probably because those two are the huge wrecks that there's plenty to look around. They'll obviously not give you the the scope and the amount of um, kind of options that something that's 105 meters in length will do but um the b17 is a a dive that you, you kind of you come out with massive massive grins um and an absolute pleasure to dive superb dive um there are uh bits of the wreckage, I think they were maybe jettisoned when it, it hit the water that are on the reef. So there are some um, kind of gun cartridges and stuff like that as well. Anyway, I could witter on about that for ages because again, it's, it's fantastic. But well, this one, so the Michael N. Maris. Michael N. Maris, um, the details say it's about 50 nautical miles out of his. It was a good old steam out to get to him, but 50 miles seems a, a heck of a long way. But anyway, that's what the details say. So um andy and his dad laurie when they aren't diving so um from a commercial diving background they're aluminium welders as well which um, is very evident when you go to their dive center and you look at the boats um they use a side scan and they are searching for new wrecks because there are known to be a lot of wrecks in the in the area and um, they got some information from fishermen uh, this is a, a favorite point for uh, for fishing and um they located the wreck they knew it was missing you know been reported in roughly this sort of area um, and they were 
fortunate enough to um, to find it, and then they've obviously registered it, and it's now um, it's their wreck. They own the wreck. So if you want to dive this wreck, it has to be done through the Manta Dive Centre. It's possible to do it, um, but you are escorted on the dive, and you you can be escorted on all the dives. Um, but on this one, you have to be escorted because um, there are things on it. So the bell's still on it, the telegraph's still on it everything that it's just as it went down basically um and andy is passionate about keeping it that way and um, so it remains as a, a fantastic dive for, for for many many years so another cargo steamship sank july 1932 it's 105 meters in length um seabed depths well sorry not seabed depths 65 meters is the deck 85 meters is a seabed so this is for us was our biggest dive. There are bigger dives out there in um, in Viz. Uh, I mentioned before, there's another B-17G that's upside down at 100 meters. Um, but for us on our trip, this was our the pinnacle of the diving, if you will. I've put that uh, pristine um, and infrequently dived. So when we went, we were the i think six of us dived it so we were maybe divers 35 through to 41 that had been on it um and it was evident from this the condition of the wreck that it, it's not been dived i've put at the bottom um penetration dot 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 you can get in it it's deep to be getting in it um but a lot of people are into that sort of thing so it, it you can do that um Uh, well, potentially a, a scary thing to do. You'd have to be very, very confident if you want to do that. So let's have a look at some pictures. So the, the wreck sits absolutely upright. Um, and the first thing you note when you get down to the wreck, the reasonable amount of current, but it's covered in purple um, fan currents. Can't see it so much on the picture. I think one of the pictures does give the colour. But it's absolutely covered in them they haven't been smashed a bit um they're everywhere and it is beautiful it, it truly is a beautiful wreck looking uh forward so you can just about make out the shot hopefully in the picture you come down the shot onto the onto the bows of the wreck and then obviously head off and have a look and as i say the deck's about 65 if you want to go down to the seabed that's a at 85 meters um so there's a picture there it shows the bell um andy hides the bell before you go on the on the wreck he puts it out of the way just in case somebody does come across the wreck and decides they're going to have it um but as i say incredibly that's still there and um, you can see from the light on the picture the color of the coral so it's, uh, it's purple it's, it's incredible it's beautiful and that as I say, the wreck's encrusted in it. It's um, not been smashed a bit by divers. Uh, what we've then got on in that picture is we've got uh, Sean and I think that's Michael coming back to the uh, back to the shot towards the um, the end of the dive. And if you were to follow up, the, the next picture shows it better. Um, the torch beams shining on the spare deck uh, prop on the deck. And I think the next there you go. So the there's the uh, picture of the, the prop that's laid there on the, uh, on the deck. One of Sean's pictures, looking in the engine room, so um, all the, the wooden parts of the structure have, uh, have kind of uh, rotted away and it, it allows you to get quite easily into, uh, into the engine room to have a look around. Um, but from our point of view so we were looking at keeping our run times on the dives to around about 100 minutes um so that others that weren't um doing the dives that were on the boat weren't um would absolutely senseless but also from a point of view of um managing um you know the, the dives themselves and making sure that we were keeping ourselves nice and uh, safe and not pushing our limits basically but um so you can get from one end of the wreck to the other i think we spent 25 minutes on the wreck uh, and back and have a quick look in the engine room within that sort of 25 minutes and then you're looking at the runtime being 
it's going to take just about uh, 100 minutes. So another picture of the corals. You can't quite get the, uh, the purpleness of them, if you will, but as I say, um, beautiful. And then we have two pictures. So the one over on the left, as you're looking at it, is looking up the, uh, the shot line. So there's a, a decent shot line. It's got a lot of um, muscles on it, so it's not something that you want to um, slide your hand up, but it's something that you can use to follow uh, as you go up. Um, and then for the diving, because of the duration of uh, the, the deco, we've got a, a deco station, a trapeze put in bar at nine, bar at six. And, um, you know, we we did our deco. Um, as I say, Andy, as they own the dive, um, they, uh, Andy comes in, does the dive with you. And he did something that had us all with our jaws wide open. I'm honest, the next picture kind of shows that. So we get back to the uh, back to the shot line. Andy's come up the shot line, but he's off the shot line. Yeah. And um, unbeknownst to us on the way down, he's clipped off his Kindle in a waterproof bag and proceeded to sit there as though he was. So hopefully he got to the point where I told you that Andy can read his Kindle while decoying that's um, pretty impressive and also slightly annoying. Just a picture showing the boat, basically. Uh, and what I was saying when I, I dropped off was that um, the family are Andy and Niska and Laurie, son, mother, father. Uh, and Niska does the recreational side dive guiding, but also cooks fantastic food. So that's us a lot tucking into food um, after one of the uh, one of the fabulous dives that we've done. But I've also got then. Um, just to, to kind of prove a point, from a recreational perspective, this is very, very worth diving. Yeah, lots of um, critters, uh, quite a lot of octopus knocking about, which is what the bottom um, right is, uh, an octopus hiding there, scorpion fish, uh, rare fish, um, conger and uh, moor eels. Loads of uh, soft and hard corals, beautiful diving, um, you know, really, really uh, impressive. The, the place sells itself on the wreck diving without a shadow of a doubt, but um, it is worth diving, not diving the wrecks. So just a, a series of pictures that put together. So looking at the, the boat uh, that we use that's top left below that tail lift. So very light but quite big catamaran that's run um, runs off two um, outboard motors a decent tail lift and makes life nice and easy decent sized deck uh, well apportioned one in the middle at the top was not setting up um first day we got there that's the idea get everything set up get it on the dive. And then in the bottom, you've got the picture that was near the start showing the, uh, the kind of view from the dive center. And then um, just because I like them, there's a picture of a couple of rebreathers as well. Uh, okay, so let's have a look. The town um, of Camisa, fishing town, but an awful lot of tourism now, um, but very, very manageable and certainly isn't overrun. A good selection of bars and restaurants, food and beer uh, is very, very reasonably priced. Croatia has its own uh, currency, the kuna, um, but anything that is so paying for the diving, paying for the accommodation, uh, euros are equally as welcome. It's a cash economy, so whilst you can use your cards in places out there, they like um, the folding stuff rather than the plastic stuff, to be honest. So a couple of pictures of us um, enjoying the, the facilities after diving. Uh, the picture on the left, as you're looking at it, shows that it's warm during the daytime in May. And the picture on the right shows that it actually gets quite chilly at night. So hoodies and coats were the order of the day. Um, we all but one dived dry suits. Um, water temperature around 16 degrees gets quite a bit warmer uh, in the summer months not ridiculous but 20s um so uh, dry suit definitely the order of the day from uh, from my perspective uh so visit itself beautiful unspoiled 
Um, so narrow streets, that's the, the picture over on the left. That's actually where the accommodation is. Uh, as I say, you're 100 metres from the dive centre, you're about 100 metres from the centre of the, the village town where um, shops, uh, so there are small supermarkets, plenty of restaurants to have a, a go at and a, a beautiful harbour. On our last day, um, so you, everything revolves around being able to get on the ferries. Um, we did a, a bit of sightseeing, so we went over to um, the main town, which is Viz, uh, the church in the middle is there. That's also a lot having a... Um, having uh, uh, a bit of something to eat. And then the view in the harbour at, um, at Viz is sort of um, bottom bottom right. So I mentioned at the start and somebody put on the comments, I wouldn't brag too much about that, but Mamma Mia 2 was filmed there. Um, so that's one area of interest. There are caves above and below water. Um, because of its strategic position, um, and the way it's been used in numerous wars, there are a lot of um, gun emplacements. There is uh, submarine um, tunnels, for want of a better way of uh, describing them, where they used to hide submarines that couldn't be spotted um, from the air. So there's loads of stuff um, that you can go and see uh, above water. You can hire motorbikes, um, you get taxis on the uh, on the island and uh, and go and have a look around. It's genuinely worth it. Nina, that was uh, part of our group, did a bit of walking. Um, so some fantastic walks where you can get up above uh, the dive centres or um, uh, above the, the main sort of towns and um, see sort of, you know, get some beautiful vistas, if you will. So John's asking, is the bike high? I'm sure there's bike high. You can pretty much get whatever you want whilst you're, uh, whilst you're out. Okay, and that um, is the picture that you basically see when you arrive, if you're arriving from the, uh, from the, the ferries. So again, the town of Viz, there's a, a church out into the, uh, into the, the natural harbour. Lovely place to have a, have a look around. Um, very, very welcoming people. Um, yeah, cracking place, to be honest. Uh, so it, when I get bored on aeroplanes, I tend to write on the pictures, but that's a, a picture from the um, deco station when um, we're finishing the dive on the Maris. Um, the, the 50p, 50p, 50p bit is the reference that John had asked the question about, can you do open circuit trimix? Oh, yes, you can. Um, gas prices, cheaper than the UK, surprisingly, but... Um, yeah, gas prices kit higher, very, very, uh, very reasonable. Yeah, it was one of the, yeah. yeah, and the the softener line works out. I think it was about seven euros a kilo, so it's what you would expect to pay elsewhere. But as I say, oxygen and helium was cheaper than you can get it in the uh, in the UK. Um, so I'm at pretty much the end, if, unless there are going to be any questions. But there are a couple of things that. Um, that I just want to kind of point out before before I finish um, wittering. I'd said there are other dive centres. I haven't used any of the, the other dive centres. Um, we use Manta and uh, Andy comes across and does the dive shows in the UK, so there's opportunities to meet him. Um, incredibly capable um, divers, incredibly uh, helpful people, but also incredibly uh, humble and uh, you know, sort of nice uh, people, anything that you want doing, uh, they can do, they can sort out, absolutely spot on. They've provided quite a few of the um, images for this. And um, as I say, we I would, I would recommend them. I recommend Viz to anybody because it's a fantastic uh, place. And if you're going to go, my personal choice would be to use uh, Man for Day. Because, as I say, really, really good sale, really, really helpful. The other side, um, so the BZAC technical side of things. Um, the, the diving out there, you can, you can do what, you know, you, you could go out and dive as an ocean diver, but you'd be looking at diving basically on the, the reefs. Nothing wrong with that. You can do some of the, you know, the, uh, the fantastic scenic dives that are out there. But to take advantage of the place, um, as a minimum, I would suggest that you need ADP. 
uh, ideally you need um, you need to be try and mix trained to take advantage of uh, of the wrecks that are out there and um, you know the so the webinar that we've put on the other webinars that were put on are being put on by BZAC, um, and it's just an opportunity to say that look the um, the the training calendar has been absolutely decimated this year, but we are starting to deliver the uh, the training again. So there are um, mixed gas courses that have been put on already, and as I say, look, it would um, if you if you're going to go out there. Do the training before you get out there and uh, and take advantage of the diving that's uh, that's available. And basically, that brings me to the uh, to the end of the uh, the presentation. Apologies for dropping out part way through. I'm not sure why that happened, but anyway, we managed to finish it off. So um, over to Mark for any questions. But just before I do, I saw one pop up that said, "Can you hire stages?" Um, you can hire so. The dive centre and no doubt the other dive centres have twin sets, um, aluminium stages, so um, Ali 80s, uh, Ali 7s, uh, you can even have steel stages if you feel that way inclined, obviously wouldn't recommend it. So yeah, anything that you want, um, three litre cylinders for rebreathers, obviously the weights, all the consumables, um, they can all be uh, arranged beforehand. One of our group um actually drove because he was coming from switzerland and um, took all his own kit that's fine as well so you know um i am aware that uh, paul fry and chris holmes have uh have dived uh croatia not actually with manta although they did the the maris and paul drove, drove across and took all the rebreathers and all the, the consumables um so those sort of things like, uh, their options see you later sean um so uh, right, I'll shut up and just see if there are any questions that uh, that Mark's picked up. Uh, there's a question about uh, gas mixers, um, Simon, if you want to talk about what gas mixers are used on the various depths. I don't know whether the um, person is, uh, at what level they, they're asking that question, but it's a general question. Yeah, no, that's fine. So, um, because we're there for a shortish period of time, and diving rebreathers, you're looking at um, so you're going to do a number of dives potentially using the uh, the same gases. So for us, day one was air dill, um, but I carried the two stages that I was going to carry to make sure that the the weightings uh, were right. Um, and then in terms of the wrecks, Andy will do whatever mix you want you can have whatever you want on the from memory and this is before uh, we were as heavily invested if you will in the gas densities uh, on the b17 we dived uh, i think 11.50 if i'm honest and it would have been something similar on the uh on the the maris because again uh maximum depth for both dives was around about 70 meters and didn't uh, on the maris go looking at props or anything like that um from my perspective there wasn't time and actually i hadn't planned to do that so um that was the um the uh the gases that we used and i think we tried to put the b17 and the maris towards the end of the week, but as it happened, we had to dive the B-17 probably the third day, whereas we wanted to do it the fourth day. Um, but um, as I say, Andy will make you whatever you want, basically. Any more for any more? Uh, there's no other questions on the feed, Simon. Marvellous. Dinner, so, do um, people are saying? <laughs> <laughs> be time for lunch yeah 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 definitely as i say i've been an hour and 20 minutes so apologies for for wittering on a bit hopefully it's been of some uh, interest and useful oh, there's a question accommodation right so no we arranged the accommodation through um through manta andy sorted out the accommodation the accommodation is uh, as i say about 100 meters away there is um 
they refer to them as a farmhouse, but it's a farmhouse in the way that a uh, a Maltese farmhouse is a farmhouse. Um, so it's uh, like a a many story uh, building, a, a stone building with. Um, so one side they are um, twin or double rooms with ensuite facilities, and there's also a, a house. So it's called Villa and Casa Nonna, Nonno. Um, and you can get, so we were going to be taking 18 people. So you can get 18 to 20 people um, across the two parts of the accommodation. Uh, as I say, one side of it's en suite. Um, the other side of it is a house that has four uh, double or twin bedrooms and it has a large kitchen area beneath it. So you can do self care if you want. To be honest, the food is that reasonable that. Um, it made sense for us not to start cooking. We didn't go on holiday to cook, to be honest. And the other um, facilities that uh, the Manta will offer is they'll do your breakfast in the morning before you go diving. They'll do your lunch whilst you're out on the boat. And we went and stopped at some fantastic locations to eat lunch in between dives. And they'll also do an evening meal. So, um, you know, you can go and be kind of completely looked after by the dive center, if that's the way um, you want to go. What we did is we had our lunch with them on the boat every day. We had a couple of breakfasts with them um, and we ate with them uh, probably a couple of nights, but we also wanted to have a look at the, the local restaurants. So, um, uh, you know, it, Andy will do as much or as little as you want him to do, to be honest. Um, you're responsible for getting yourself to Vizio, organise the taxis that go and pick you up and bring you across the island, and it can fulfil every sort of need that you've got whilst you're on the island in terms of, uh, you know, the, the diving, sightseeing, um, pretty much everything, to be honest. Have you got a rough cost of the trip, Simon? Oh, I knew somebody was going to ask that. Uh, so, right, flights, around about 250 quid. Uh, what we worked on was 350 quid would get you to uh, to and from Viz, so that would cover, uh, let me think, you'd book your own flight, so that was around about 250 quid, and then we, it cost us 350 quid to get from the airport to Viz to cover the diving in terms of how we hired the boat, um that covered the accommodation and our transport back so on top of that you then had your dive consumables and and uh and food so 250 for the flight 350 for uh accommodation and diving so we're at 600 quid um so if you looked at around about a, a thousand pounds uh including your food drink and dive consumables you'd not be a million miles off well, thank you for okay. your time for you, Simon. Uh, we wish you well for the rest thank of the you. weekend. Have a good weekend, everyone.